Welcome back, everybody. I hope you were able to partake of some rest and nourishment during the break. The focus of our symposium, as I hope has become clear already, uh, has much to do with and has much to say to the many challenges that we're facing today. For those of us in the United States, a uh, tragic school shooting. For those of us across the globe, the invasion of Ukraine and the war there. Specific to in New Mexico, where Upaya is located, massive forest fires. This afternoon, we're going to have an opportunity to increasingly explore some of the specifics of the ways in which the an action perspective is able to address practical important challenges. We're going to begin with a brief period of meditation that's going to be led by John Dunn. John is the distinguished chair in contemplative humanities at the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he's also professor and chair in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. So John, thank you so much. Thank you, Al. Hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. <clears throat> we'll just spend a few minutes here now, sort of to settle our minds, but maybe in the spirit of what we've been talking about, we'll also use this opportunity to inquire into our experience, perhaps somewhat from an inactive perspective. So let's just begin now by finding a comfortable position. If you're sitting in a chair, you may find it helpful to have your feet flat on the floor. The sense of the spine is, the spine is strong, but flexible. Holiday personality for Alexa and Omar Sorry about this. that the spine is strong, but flexible. A strong back and open front. And then just drop down into the body. Simply notice how it feels to be present here. Allow Mother Earth to hold us, no effort needed. I'd like to invite you now to allow the mind to rest on an anchor for the attention. I'd like to suggest that you use the soundscape that we explore the epistemology of listening, so to speak. Whatever is happening in your soundscape, perhaps let go of any evaluation. Is this the sound you want to hear or not? Simply notice, open your attention to the soundscape. There's no need to fixate on the sound. Simply like having your hand on a buoy in the water Allow the attention to rest gently on the soundscape. If your attention is captured by something else, simply note that, let go, return to sound. 
Notice perhaps how the attention tends to settle on a particular feature of the soundscape. No need to resist that. Go ahead and allow the attention to settle that way. The sound of a fan, of a neighbor, whatever it might be. Notice the sound, the hearing, the listening. Where is this sound happening, the listening? Where is this listening happening? Outside, inside? In the mind, outside the mind? Sound emerges from silence. Can you hear the silence with the sound? And now recollecting why we're here, what our aspirations are, our care for the world that is facing so much suffering. I invite you to let go of all effort, all intention to do anything simply with these last moments. Be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. So it's my pleasure to introduce Evan Thompson, who is professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. As you heard this morning, and as many of you know, uh, Evan, is one of the founding contributors to the perspective of inaction, co-authoring the book with Francisco Varela and Eleanor Roche, The Embodied Mind, in which some of the, the basics and also the complexities of inaction were laid out. So I think very appropriate that John gets us started, uh, I, that Evan rather gets us started this afternoon with his presentation on inaction, uh, looking back and looking forward. Evan. Thank you. Evan is actually the Welsh form of John, so it's, it's fine to call me John. 
So I am going to uh, now try to share my screen and I don't think I have permission to do it yet. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right. So now this is going to be okay. So can everybody see and can everybody hear? Okay, good. Well, greetings, everyone, and good afternoon, at least afternoon where I am. I want to begin by acknowledging that I am an uninvited guest on the unceded and traditional homeland of the Senex people. I am in the Slocan Valley in British Columbia in an area called Valakan and in the view of the sacred mountain, Frog Mountain. What I would like to do in this talk <clears throat> is to offer some thoughts about an action and to do it both retrospectively and then um, forwardly. And I want to do this with particular reference to the role that Buddhist thought, Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist practice played in the formulation of the enacted view. And I'll also say some things about how I see that now in the, in the looking forward part of the talk. This is how we defined the enacted view in the embodied mind. We wrote, we propose as a name the term enactive to emphasize the growing conviction that cognition is not the representation of a pre-given world by a pre-given mind, but is rather the enactment of a world and a mind on the basis of a history of the variety of actions that a being in the world performs. So as I said, I want to, I want to say some things first um, about looking back at this initial formulation on specifically the role that, that Buddhist thought played, and then to take a forward look. And I'm going to emphasize three key ideas that played a role in this book, The Embodied Mind. And these are the ideas of an action, of course, but also groundlessness and ethics. So I'll, I'll go through these one by one. When we defined an action in the embodied mind, so this is actually towards the end of the book, the quotation that I just gave you was actually from the beginning, but when we come to an action at the end, towards the end of the book, we sort of build up to it as Ezekiel described, we define it in terms of three questions. And here we're really thinking about an action as a, as a view or an orientation or an approach within the framework of cognitive science. So. The first question was, what is cognition? And our answer is an action. And this is a word that we introduced and used in, in this context that, um, that Francisco came up with. It actually has an interesting older history. Jerome Bruner used it to talk about sensory motor knowledge in his writings in the 1960s and developmental psychology. And I think Francisco might've been aware of this, but we actually didn't refer explicitly to, um, to Bruner in, in using the word because we gave it a, a somewhat um, different slant, though there is some overlap. So what is cognition and action? And then we said a history of structural coupling that brings forth a world. Now, structural coupling is an idea that really harkens back to what's sometimes called second generation cybernetics. So thinkers like Heinz von Forster and Gregory Bateson and Umberto Maturana, who was Francisco's, um, Francisco Varela's mentor. And in very general terms, it's the idea of um, systems whose activity you could say is a function of each other or is interdependently linked to each other, but a way in which say in the case of an organism and an environment, there's coupling, but not determination because what happens is a function of the organism's own inner organization and, and constitution as, a, as an autonomous system. So then the second question was, how does it work? And what we wrote was through a network consisting of multiple levels of interconnected sensory motor subnetworks. So network is a, is a key concept here. A network is something that consists of nodes or elements 
that are interconnected in, in dense ways that, for example, generate self-organizing or, or non-linear activity. We were particularly thinking of this in the context of animal life and the nervous system. So that's why we emphasize the, the sensory motor there. But the idea is really more general than that. It, it's really the idea of what today, and this of course was also Francisco's terminology, the idea of what today we would call an autonomous system. And Ezekiel uh, went through a lot of the, the dialectical logic of that. And then third question, how do I know when a cognitive system is functioning adequately? And the answer we gave is when it becomes part of an ongoing existing world as the young of every species do, and especially, of course, in the case of social animals like, like mammals or particularly primates, or shapes a new one as happens in evolutionary history. So this is the idea of what today some biologists talk about in terms of niche construction, the idea that the organism actively shapes constructs its world, both developmentally, but of course also phylogenetically in the form of opening up whole new modes of life through evolutionary history. So this is the initial way that we, we frame the view. And I think you can see very much in recent statements, the, the, the same idea articulated you know, in, um, in some ways in more precise ways, more refined ways. So in this book, Linguistic Bodies by Ezekiel and Hana and um, Elena Kufari, we have the statement, the key insight of the inactive approach is to conceive of mental life as the ongoing meaningful engagement between precariously constituted embodied agents and the worlds of significance they bring forth in their self-asserting activity. So self-asserting activity is this idea of autonomy or in the sort of paradigm case of, of cellular life autopoiesis, self-production, cellular self-production. And precarious is now explicit in this statement. So this signals in Buddhist language, you could say it signals impermanence, that we're always dealing with challenging contingencies. And the question is always how we respond to them in living. And to be embodied is to be precarious. That as I, as I like to put it, building on both language from from Ezekiel and from Francisco and from Hans Jonas, living is sense-making in precarious conditions. Now, one thing I want to emphasize right at the outset here is that in this framework, we have an interdependence that's beyond subject and object. Now, I don't necessarily mean experientially beyond subject and object because you know, it's not as if you can just induce that sort of just by saying some words and maybe some people can, but. Um, but I don't think that was our aim. It's rather that we're attempting to, we were attempting to develop a theoretical framework that didn't start from an assumption of the subject object framework as adequate for understanding life or adequate for understanding cognition. So cognition means sense-making and sense-making means that we have self-individuating processes, bodies, processes that that dialectically distinguish and differentiate themselves in the way that Ezekiel was talking about, those processes emerge out of the very processes that they make sense of and that constitute their worlds. And we could analyze this at all sorts of levels ranging from the biochemical in the case of cellular life to the formation of an individual in the case of social life. So the idea is that embodied agents and their worlds aren't external to each other, that we have to start from a framework that makes interdependence the, the fundamental premise, if you will, rather than assuming a kind of subject object framework. So this brings me then to the second key idea, which is the idea of groundlessness. We use this word in the embodied mind to indicate the idea that cognition, or we might say knowledge, and the world, we might say being, have no absolute ground, no, no fundamental foundation. There's no final anchor point. That is to say, it's interdependent relations all the way back, if we're talking historically, either evolutionarily or indeed cosmologically, all the way down, if we're thinking of it in terms of um, different spatio-temporal levels or scales, and all the way round in the sense of interlocking interdependencies in the moment for anything that we individuate as a system. So self and world then aren't pre-given, 
and independent, they are rather enacted in and through webs of relations. Now, the third idea is the idea of ethics. And I want to read you something that we wrote. This is actually the penultimate paragraph in The Embodied Mind. We wrote, so this is in 1991. Well, we actually wrote this probably in 1989 or 88. Although late 20th century science repeatedly undermines our conviction in an ultimate ground, we nonetheless continue to seek one. We have laid down a path in both cognitive science and human experience that would lead us away from this dilemma. We repeat that this is not a merely philosophical dilemma. It is also ethical, religious, and political. Grasping can be expressed not only individually as fixation on ego self, but also collectively as fixation on racial or tribal self-identity, as well as grasping for a ground as the territory that separates one group of people from another or that one group would appropriate as its own. The idolatry of supposing not only that there is a ground, but that one can appropriate it as one's own acknowledges the other only in a negative, in a purely negative exclusionary way. The realization of groundlessness as non-egocentric responsiveness, however, requires that we acknowledge the other with whom we dependently co-originate. If our task in the years ahead, as we believe, is to build and dwell in a planetary world, then we must learn to uproot and release the grasping tendency, especially in its collective manifestations. Unfortunately, everything we mention here is very much still our situation today. And indeed, the one thing we don't mention explicitly, though we were certainly aware of it through thinkers like Gregory Bateson and Amory Lovins and Hazel Henderson, who just passed away this week, is the climate crisis. So acknowledging the other with whom we codependently originate has to now explicitly be understood to mean acknowledging other life forms, particularly the biosphere and indeed the whole earth. All right, so that's a very quick tour through some of the key ideas that were really, I suppose, the, the motivating and animating ideas of importance for us, why, why, we were, why we were articulating these ideas beyond just an action as a particular kind of approach to understanding the mind within the context of, of science. So what I want to say now is something about the role of Buddhism Buddhist thinking, Buddhist practice, Buddhist philosophy, the role that Buddhism played for us in the embodied mind and in formulating the inactive approach. So this basically consisted of three things. The first was the idea of no self or, or not self, depending on how you want to translate anatman. We use this idea to try to bring out the philosophical and experiential implications of the cognitive science discovery of the lack of a substantial self. This in cognitive science occurs in multiple contexts, of course, and I, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details of that now, but basically the idea is that when we start investigating the mind and, and the self and the sense of identity from a cognitive science perspective, it's very apparent that there is no single permanent fixity that the word self refers to, that whatever we're calling self is fluid and constructed and interdependent and impermanent. And we use particularly the Abhidharma framework in Buddhist philosophy to try to bring out these implications around the idea of no self. And then that led into a discussion of the Buddhist ideas of emptiness and dependent origination and they played actually a direct role in formulating the idea of cognition as an action. And I, and I will come back to that. And then thirdly, we talked about meditation. We called it in the embodied mind, mindfulness awareness, or sometimes we talked about mindful awareness. And we described this as providing a path of human transformation for relating experientially to no self and to groundlessness and for fostering ethical awareness and action. And I'll come back and say some things about this um, in the looking forward part. So what I wanna do now is I wanna trace these ideas, these, these Buddhist ideas, particularly the first two, 
in terms of the role they played for us in our formulation of the inactive approach in cognitive science. And the way that we did this is through these successive waves of thinking in cognitive science that we called cognitivism, emergence, and then the inactive view. Emergence could also be, was, was at the time also called connectionism. Today, we would talk about neural network theory. We would talk about complex systems theory. We would talk about machine learning, depending on the context. Cognitive, cognitivism is the traditional orthodox view that the mind can be understood as a digital computer. Emergence emphasizes um, networks of processing that aren't symbolic in the classical cognitivist sense. And then in action, of course, emphasizes the ideas of autonomy and sensory motor um, coupling. So I'm going to go through a little bit about the way that Buddhism entered into this for us. Okay, so if we're just thinking of classical cognitive science, the computer model of the mind, it's, you might say, foundational philosophical roots lie in what philosophers call the representational theory of the mind. The idea that the mind represents, the mind is a kind of inner realm that represents the outside world. And in the definition I gave you of an action at the very beginning of the talk, we contrasted an action with the representational view. So in the Western tradition, these are philosophers like Locke and Kant, and then scientists like Hemholtz. The roots of an active cognitive science, however, go outside European philosophy. So particularly we drew from Buddhist philosophy. And this is how we put it at one point early in the book. We said, were we to entertain the idea that there is no hard and fast distinction between science and philosophy, then philosophers such as Descartes, Locke, Leibniz, Hume, Kant, and Husserl would take on a new significance. They could be seen among other things as proto-cognitive scientists, or as Jerry Fodor puts it in intellectual history, everything happens twice, first as philosophy and then as cognitive science. I, I love that statement. Might this not also be the case for philosophical traditions with which we are less familiar? So we set up a parallel, an analogy between a progression of thought from Abhidharma analysis to Madhyamaka middle way philosophy on the one hand and cognitivism to connectionism or neural network theory to inactive thinking on the other hand. And I wanna describe how this parallel looked to us at the time. So Abhidharma in very, very general terms is a kind of, you could say it's a kind of reductive analysis. It takes phenomena such as the self or macroscopic you know, objects of perception and analyzes them into elementary processes that are called dharmas. And this is analogous to the kind of analysis you might say that we see in science in general, but in the context of cognitive science, particularly the analysis of cognitive systems into their constituent functions and networks. So a kind of, you might say, reductive decompositional analysis of a system that we naively take as a whole into processes that are, you might say, the support for our impositioning, it, for our conceptual imposition of it as being a whole. Then in Madhyamaka, middle way philosophy, we have a deepening of the critical analysis so that dharmas themselves, which are taken to be intrinsically real and intrinsically identifiable in the Abhidharma framework, dharmas themselves are considered to be empty of intrinsic being, empty of an inherent nature or an inherent being with intrinsic identifiable characteristics. And we saw the progression from a kind of network analysis in cognitive science into our inactive reframing of cognition as embodied action that brings forth a world through structural coupling. We saw that as analogous because of the emphasis on groundlessness and interdependency that, that I talked about a few minutes ago. Okay, so just to say a little bit more about that, in Abhidharma, anything that appears to be an independent entity, like the self, for example, with its own causal power, an agent, is analyzed into processes that arise in dependence on conditions. So some of the processes are mental, different kinds of you know, mental events. Some of them are physical, having to do with the body. What we call mind then is a collection of interactive processes 
some physical and some mental that arise together with what we call the object of cognition. So you could say, you, you could say subject and object, but that's not quite right because it's not as if there is a subject and an object, there's rather a network within which the object and the experience of that object are co-emergent. So we used, this is explicit in Abhidharma, but we used Abhidharma to tease this out of cognitive science where it is implicit, but not really recognized. So the way that we would put that maybe in a more scientific language would be to say, what we call mind is a collection of interactive processes that span and interconnect the brain, the rest of the body and the environment. And what we call the object of cognition is defined by these interactive processes. This description isn't fully adequate because it's emphasizing, you might say more the kind of biological side where we would really need to bring in uh, a richer sort of psychological level of description to do full justice to the idea. But this is in general terms, um, the, the framework at this stage of the analysis. Now, when we move to Madhyamaka, we have this kind of deepened critical perspective in which all phenomena, including what would be called dharmas from the Abhidharma perspective are empty of own being, of, their, of, of an inherent being. All phenomena are interdependently originated and they are therefore groundless. That is, they, they lack an absolute foundation. So the parallel here or the influence in cognitive science is to emphasize exactly this idea of interdependent origination for a cognitive system and its world. Cognition has no ground beyond its interdependently originated history. Now this has a further implication though, if you, if you follow the logic all the way through, and this is something we made explicit in the embodied mind, this has a further implication for how we think about science itself. Science itself is an epistemic practice. It's a form of cognition. It's thereby, therefore by our own, the logic of our own framework, it's a form of cognition as an action. That is to say that science reveals the world in relation to our conceptual systems, our methods of investigation and our modes of action. Science is a human epistemic practice. It's not something that happens from a God's eye perspective, though traditionally, you know, many scientists would, would want to envision it that way. So an active cognitive science, one of the things that distinguishes it from other forms of cognitive science is that it makes this reflexive loop explicit, that we have to apply the logic to science itself, the logic of groundlessness, the logic of inaction, the logic of coupling, and so on. And just as an aside, this way of thinking is the theme of the book that um, Adam Frank and Marcelo Gleiser and I are almost finished writing. We should within the next two to three weeks have it sent off to um, MIT Press that's called The Blind Spot. And you can get a little taste of what we're doing there in this article that appeared in ION um, a couple of years ago. Okay, so I've said something about the idea of non-self in, in Abhidharma and how we brought that to bear on cognitive science. I've said something about how that then was developed through drawing on Madhyamaka and Yogacara in formulating the idea of cognition as inaction. And I wanna just mention something about meditation, which is that in the embodied mind, meditation is single that is very important, but it needs to be said that the form of meditation that we were really writing about was first of all from the Tibetan Kagyu tradition, which was the tradition in which both Francisco and Eleanor Roche practiced. And we were also drawing from texts that were written by Tibetan teachers for Western audiences. So not so much traditional texts and both Francisco and Eleanor were students of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. So they were very influenced by his particular way of presenting meditation in the, well, the 1960s and the 1970s. And we presented, so that is just to say that it's a, that there was a particular kind of tradition that was refracting what we were, what we were saying about, what we were saying about meditation. And these would all be things I would foreground today where I sort of rewriting this because it's important to, I think, be, be not, uh, to not quite allied the sources in, it's not that we allied them, but we, we had an 
appendix in, we list, in which we listed the books of meditation that were important to us, but we presented it as if it was, you know, here's what meditation is. And, and you know, and that, and that, that's, that's obviously inadequate. We also presented meditation as if it were a kind of phenomenology that you, you could get sort of direct evidence about the mind, particularly evidence that would support an inactive view. And I would say from our perspective today that that's somewhat naive, that meditation is very much framed by conceptual systems and that it's not as if you just enter into meditation with no conceptual system and then you discover what the mind is like. And we sometimes wrote that way. So I, I bring these things out just to say that looking back now, you know, 30 years later, these aspects of the discussion of the role of meditation in relation to science and philosophy, um, I think would strike, should strike us as, as, as naive and, and as problematic in various ways. Okay, so to summarize that then, Buddhist philosophy with links to meditation played a key role in formulating the inactive view, both as a first order view about the mind in cognitive science and as a second order view about science itself. And so now transitioning to where we are today, none of these fields really was present when we were writing The Embodied Mind. These fields that are, that are listed here are much more well-established. So within cognitive science, the embodied perspective is very well recognized. We of course now have the scientific study of meditation, the cognitive science of meditation or the cognitive science of contemplative practices where contemplative scholars are an integral part of the research and we're much more nuanced in how we, how we describe contemplative practices and the practice traditions from which they come. Buddhist studies, particularly the study of Buddhist philosophy in the Western academic sense is far more developed than when we were writing. Philosophy, pursued cross-culturally is, is much more developed. It's still a minority type of thing, but it's way more developed than when I was a graduate student, when, which was when I was working on the embodied mind. And contemplative studies is now recognized as the field where the study of contemplative practices is seen to require the humanities and the social sciences and scholars who are steeped also in, you might say, anthropological field work and practice experience themselves. So none of this was really present when we were writing The Embodied Mind. So the situation now is, is much more developed and, and these are all definitely you know, good things. But looking forward, there is one area that I think is still very much underdeveloped and that I think this meeting of ours here is happening in recognition of, and that is what we might call an act of ethics. There is definitely some work that is starting to be done on this. Um, Ezekiel and Hannah have, have written a very uh, important paper on this, published just this past year or last year. There's a, a special issue of a, of a journal devoted to an act of ethics in which that paper appeared. But this is still underdeveloped and particularly what I would call the ethics of knowledge. Because remember in the an act of logic, if we're thinking especially of scientific knowledge, scientific knowledge is a kind of an act of cognition. That is to say, it is a kind of world making and world making is inherently normative. It's, it's, it's something that needs to be thought about in terms of the values that it presupposes and the values that it embodies. So this is still a relatively underdeveloped uh, aspect of the conversation. So I want to um, come at this idea in a little bit of a roundabout way by going back to the, the relationship between Buddhism and cognitive science that figured in the embodied mind and contrast that with something that I see as a, as a very prevalent element today, which is a trend to try to naturalize Buddhism. So I'm gonna say something about what exactly that means or how I understand what that refers to. So naturalizing Buddhism basically proceeds, so this is in the context of the Buddhism science encounter, you could say. It proceeds by taking the scientific representation of nature as objectively real, and then reinterpreting Buddhist concepts accordingly. Now, th this is to put it in an extreme way. There's, you know, there's a range of things that could be done here. 
to give you an extreme version of what I have in mind, Robert Wright's book, Why Buddhism is True, basically does this. It says, you know, here's what evolutionary psychology says about the mind. Um, that's real. And now we're going to reinterpret Buddhism accordingly to modernize Buddhism, to make it, you know, palatable for, for those of us who inhabit the modern world, particularly those of us who inhabit, let's say, North America. So that goes by, say, taking concepts like awakening, bodhi, or, or liberation, nirvana, and translating them into something that makes scientific sense, a psychological state of well-being, however we choose to operationalize well-being, or if we're a little bit more sort of liberal and fringy, a transpersonal psychological state of enlightenment or illumination, reinterpreting a concept like dukkha, suffering as emotional craving or self-grasping coming from, you might say, styles of attachment or um, personal developmental histories, or maybe even the biology of mammalian life. I mean, Robert Wright sort of sees this as um, what natural selection kind of gives to us that we have to deal with. And then meditation as a kind of mental training that is meant to help us deal with emotional craving and self-grasping and ideally instill or induce well-being or enlightenment understood trans um, personally. So I mentioned this, um, I mentioned this trend, we could have a whole discussion of this trend, both its advantages and disadvantages. And, and I mean, I'd be happy to do that, but I, that, that's not really why I'm mentioning it. I'm mentioning it because it's actually different from what we were concerned to do in using Buddhism in developing the inactive view. Because what we wanted to do was to use, for example, a concept like dependent origination to formulate the idea, the inactive idea of cognition and world co-arising in mutual dependence. We used Buddhist philosophy to describe the relation of science to human experience and to critique objectivism. So our approach was not to say, here's what science says about nature, now let's reinterpret Buddhism accordingly. Our approach was to say, here's how science is developing and it's hitting a point where these Buddhist concepts are actually going to be productive for it. And then of course, though I wouldn't say it's for me to say, maybe these scientific developments would also be beneficial to Buddhism in its you know, evolving path into the modern world. So that was very much how we were thinking about an action in the embodied mind. Buddhism actually played a substantial formative role for us. So the approach then allowed us, that approach allowed us to cross-fertilize Buddhist thought and practice with other sympathetic scientific and philosophical sources. Oh, in particular, I would mention second generation cybernetics. So this is really Francisco's early work on autopoiesis and the logics of self-reference. Second generation cybernetics, I should also mention Bateson here besides Maturana and Van Forster. Second generation cybernetics had already come to the realization that when you focus on, the, on a system, as classical cybernetics does, and you say a system is self-individuating or self-regulating, then you have to reflexively apply that to yourself as an observer. The observer is a system, or the observer takes up a stance toward itself as a system. And how does that happen? What does a system need to be in order to be an observer? And what does an observer need to do in order to pick out or individuate something as a system? This is explicit in the work of Maturana and Van Forster and Bateson. And so this already is terrain in which inactive ideas and Buddhist ideas coming from, um, from I would say, especially from Madhyamaka, but even Abhidharma for that matter, already um, can, can engage with productively. And then of course, also the phenomenological tradition, which we used in the embodied mind. So thinkers like Husserl and Merleau-Ponty, who unlike the second generation cybernetic thinkers who still have a tendency to remain abstract, the phenomenological thinkers anchor this in the experience of the body, in, in the lived body and the relationship between the, the lived body and the, and the lived environment. So already in 20th century science and philosophy, we have these developments that are enriched through the cross-fertilization with Buddhist thought and practice. And of course, Francisco as an individual embodied this. 
and that feed into or fed into the formulation of the inactive approach. Okay, so that's a roundabout way then of coming to what I mean by the ethics of knowledge. The way that I would pose this is that given that the quest for knowledge is open-ended and that the amount to be known is, is infinite, yet we are finite beings, we need to ask about the ethics of what and how we seek to know. What kind of lives do we wish to lead and what kinds of knowledge should we seek? In relation to our theme of interdependence, given planetary interdependence, which as already mentioned is evidenced especially by pandemics and by climate change, what ethics of knowledge should we be seeking to create and embody? I want to come into the end of the talk by pulling in a thread here that comes from the work of Kyle White, who is an indigenous scholar and philosopher. And he has an article in this book called the Rutledge Handbook of Critical Indigenous Studies. It's, the article is actually called Against Crisis Epistemology. And I talked about this article in last year's Upaya talk, and I'm not, I'm not gonna go through the whole article, but he contrasts what he calls crisis epistemology, which is immediately trying to instrumentally intervene in the face of crisis to alter things often with good intentions, but in a way that exacerbates crisis by not being rooted in a larger ethical framework or in a larger perspective that is concerned with the ethics of knowledge. Whereas in contrast, the epistemology of what he calls coordination is an epistemological framework in which the ethics of knowledge is explicit. And he finds this in indigenous intellectual traditions. So he writes, Epistemology of coordination is ways of knowing the world that emphasize the importance of moral bonds or kinship relations for generating the responsible capacity to respond to constant change. It's important to understand here, he's explicit about this in the article, that kinship here doesn't mean limited biological kinship, though that's of course where kinship starts. Kinship is the idea that the kinds of bonds that we find paradigmatically and prototypically in biological kinship need to be enlarged, extended across all of humanity, but also, of course, to our earth as a whole. The world isn't an it, in other words, from the point of view of the epistemology of coordination. The world is, is a thou to whom or to which we have an ethical bond. White talks about how the climate crisis is a manifestation of the longstanding and ongoing disruption to social relationships between settlers and indigenous peoples, the global north and south, rich and poor, and human beings in the biosphere. We have a tendency, especially in crisis epistemology, to think the climate crisis is because of carbon emissions. That's what the climate crisis is. Well, yes, it is, but that is the outcome of longstanding and ongoing disruptions to social relationships that have to do with industrialization and colonialism. So the task then is to repair those relationships and to establish new ones. So I will end with the connection that I see between this idea of coordination epistemology and an action, which is that Coordination epistemologies, in White's words, organize knowledge through the vector of kinship relationships, that is, through social relations and ethical bonds, including to the more than human world. And knowledge here includes what we would call scientific knowledge. We don't think of scientific knowledge as something to be organized through the vector of kinship relations. But this is what White is, in, is calling us to do, is that we, we, need, to, we need to think of science as you could say, a method of knowing as something that needs to be resituated, science and of course policy, within this ethics of kinship and coordination. So the inactive view, I think, has something very important to offer here, particularly the work that Hannah has been doing also with Ezekiel and others on participatory sense-making and loving and knowing, because it provides a philosophical perspective 
and it provides some scientific resources, obviously others are needed, but it provides some for coordination epistemologies and for ethics of care. Care has already come up in our discussions in the morning. And I would say that, I would, I would add to what's been said already that this phrase ethics of care actually, at least in, in English speaking thought emerged in the context of feminist philosophy and psychology. And the idea is that an ethics of care is different from either a traditional, what philosophers would call deontological ethics, ethics based on obligations, duties, oughts, or what philosophers would call consequentialist ethics, ethics that have to do with evaluating the consequences in terms of some value, classically utility in utilitarianism, or even virtue ethics, where ethics is about cultivating virtues like compassion, courage, wisdom. The ethics of care is a framework in which care becomes the primary ethical notion. Obviously, a lot has to be said about what that, what that is and care for whom and care in what context, but it's a way of shifting ethical discourse away from just thinking about rights and duties and consequences into a framework that very much is aligned with this idea of coordination epistemology and the vector of kinship relationships and that fundamentally has to be oriented in terms of how we attend to and foster forms of participatory sense-making that embody a way of knowing that can help us with all of the problems that we face in the world right now. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evan. It's wonderful, wonderful, Evan. I'm just thinking about Carol Gilligan's work in this regard. Right. Yes, she's one of the um, sort of founding figures of the uh, of the ethics of care. She was she was criticized a little bit because, at least by later feminists, because her 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 conceptions of care sometimes. How do I put this? They they were refracted through traditional gender roles. So the yeah. mother, for example. So subsequent feminists, you know, were were. Some were quite critical, but ones who were sympathetic tried to, you know, in a sympathetic way, develop the ethics of care so that it wasn't refracted through that, that particular um, gendered, traditional gendered framework. Yeah, I, th I think that um, uh, uh, putting care and justice in a certain way in conflict with each other um, uh, is, you know, was an area of dispute in her work. But I, you know, and I think an ethic, ethics of care, uh, it actually includes justice. Yeah, definitely. So and I think they're complementary. Amy, yeah, they're, they're yeah. Uh, Amy, I, I think you're going to reflect for some moments on. Yeah, yes, thank you, Roshi. I, I, uh, I'm happy to see you, Evan, it was, um, um, you covered a lot of ground. Um, I think um, we'll probably come back to these questions of um, crisis epistemology and ethics of care, but I sort of wanted to go back to the beginning, your discussion of the influences of the Buddhist um, thinking on the work um, to develop the inactive approach. And, and um, I was remembering as you were speaking that um, during the time of writing of the embodied mind, there was something almost kind of illicit about it because at that time, Francisco certainly, maybe you were as a grad student in a slightly safer position, but, um, and as a grad student in religious studies as well with the two-hadded aspect, um, uh, or might've been a little bit safer, but it was really risky for, for him, for anybody to be a public Buddhist at the time and, and uh, or to use Eastern philosophy as a, as a reference. So I think it's, it's anecdotal, but it's kind of relevant um, and interesting in itself, this, this risk um, from the other 
that existed until very, very recently, the other being Eastern philosophy, Eastern practices, and this sort of thing that was um, totally prevalent, even you know, in both the United States and in, um, in Europe in the 1980s, it started changing really a decade later. Um, yeah, just just to quickly jump in on the on the riskiness, um, it was risky for me too, actually, because I was a grad student, right? I wasn't an established, uh, you know, professor or scientist. And one very prominent uh, person in cognitive science, I won't mention their name. I know who you're talking. About. Who, whose work I actually <laughs> respect a lot, uh -huh. um, told me that what I was doing was ill advised and not. To the advantage of my career in working on the embodied mind so okay. um yeah that's right yeah well point well taken i do remember that incident or series of incidents anyway or letters um um and i wanted to just pick up again on the fact that you wrote an entire book on this question that you just touched on or at least what seems like an entire book on this on the subject of uh, Buddhism and science and um, and the fact that the great majority of attempts at synthesizing Buddhism and science um, tend to treat Buddhist philosophical ideas as complements to the Western scientific and this what you call a complementary um, position to Western science concept conceptualizations. Um, extracting from the Buddhist corpus <clears throat> the concepts that are amenable to a reductive naturalistic vision. So that's why I'm not a Buddhist. Um, um, and um, so with this move comes what you were mentioning earlier, which was this revisionist rereading of Buddhism um, that you critique in that book. and obliquely tonight in uh, or today, um, calling it Buddhist modernism. And that's uh, sort of the central thesis of that book, I think. Um, Buddhist modernism being an entirely different animal um, from, from a, a kind of a denaturing of the tradition or, or a transformation in any case, a more neutral term of the tradition. So um, as you've told us tonight, faced with these pitfalls, of between in the Buddhist and scientific uh, conversation, you suggest the replacement of the notion of complementarity, that these two areas can complement each other in some way with the notion of mutual circulation between these two traditions, the Buddhist and the Western scientific. And in other words, putting these lineages into dialogue, um, Francisco would have called it rubbing them together. Um, as you sketched for us already, um, in, in your description tonight. So I'm kind of retaking the parts of what I picked up. Um, and this, puts, this really does put the two domains, Buddhism and science in a properly inactive dialogical relationship. Um, and what emerges is our responsibility. Um, and I think that's sort of the imminent ethics in inaction. Um, and thus the need for an, what you call the need for an ethics of knowledge grounded in concrete situatedness in and with our world. So um, I have two questions. One is one is kind of specific and, it hard, and then people can ask the questions they want because I'm not really touching on the last, I don't know very much about coordination epistemology. So um, it's fascinating, but one is quite specific and it harkens back to Richie's question about people's willingness to enlarge their horizons or um, uh, what Ziki also called widening the sense making in some way or another. Um, and this question does refer to this dialogue between Buddhism and science. And what I'm wondering from this point of view is how you now envisage projects like the neurophenomenological method for the study of mind, which was devised to bring together, as you know, but for the audience, um, first person experience uh, with third person or objective data. Um, and I'm wondering, having listened to you that, and listened to Ezekiel and Hannah and, and the discussions, I'm wondering if one of the difficulties of carrying out neurophenomenological experience might be that we are hard put to jettison this notion of complementarity. Um, in particular, if jettisoning it leaves us with a longer and more winding path 
which is the path of mutual circulation. Um, so I'm thinking about practical uses of mutual circulation and thinking that many prefer the shorter path, even if it's inefficient and inefficacious um, over the long way home. And the second question, which is much shorter, which is related, so that's the neurophenomenology and uh, the future of science in Buddhism um, in terms of scientific practices question. And the second one is, is related and it says, it's, I was thinking, you know, we, we keep on calling, we call it an action, but we call it a view, we call it a theory, we evoke the idea of calling it a way of life. And listening to you and, and the others, I asked myself if we could call an action a practice, maybe the practice of a long way home. So I'm wondering whether you have, whether that re resonates with you at all, um, those thoughts. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, yeah, so, in, so the first one, I guess, an action and neurophenomenology, you know, words that Francisco, um, introduced and ideas, frameworks that he elaborated, what's, what's the relationship between them? Uh, I think that that's an interesting question and it depends who you ask. You'll get different answers to that question. Um, some people think of neurophenomenology as sort of the next step after an action, you know, that Francisco did an action in the, you know, not in the like nineties and then developed neurophenomenology. Um, I don't really think of it that way myself. I, I think of neurophenomenology in, in the particular way that Francisco described it, it, it really arose in the context of, of trying to understand consciousness or lived experience in the setting of, at that time, what was, what was really forming as cognitive neuroscience with new, you know, with new tools, you know, high density EEG and fMRI and things like that. And you know, Francisco's idea was, that we need to, in order to investigate, you know, consciousness isn't like other objects of, it's not an object at all, actually, but it, so that means it's not like other objects of scientific investigation. And so it needs to be, the mutual circulation there needs to, to happen through, you know, a, a disciplined investigation of lived experience through contemplative practice, coupled with certain types of um, practices of interviewing individuals about their experience to elicit textures or shapes or information that then could inform neuroscientific research that then could revise and enrich the experiential in this kind of mutual circulation way. But I see it as very much situated within a particular research approach, which was you know, what today we would call the neuroscience of consciousness. Um, so that seems to me like a subcategory of something that's much bigger, which is which is an action. That's that's how I view it. Not not everybody views it that way, but that but that would be my own way of doing, of looking at it. So another way to put it, maybe a much more succinct way to put it, would be to say that neurophenomenology is a particular instance of mutual circulation in the context of the neuroscientific study of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I would say, for the most part, that has not been taken up by the field. I mean, there are some studies that pursue a neurophenomenological approach to varying degrees. It's not like we can't point to anything. There are certainly some studies, but by and large, that's not what's usually done in the neuroscience of consciousness. And so it's still very undeveloped, I think, in the full rich sense in which Francisco envisioned it. So, so that's, that's and, and for him, Buddhism was, a partic was particularly important in that setting because he saw Buddhist practices as, in, and here I would, I would actually be maybe critical he, he saw them as, as, as special or exceptional for the purposes of neurophenomenology. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that today we would need to have a richer discussion about that, that they would be one you know, setting or, or one type of practice that, that's very important for neurophenomenology, but to place the kind of um, exceptionalist emphasis on them that he did, I, I at least personally wouldn't be comfortable with. I think there are other other kinds of practices and other approaches that would be that would be equally, equally useful, equally important. Um, so then the second question. Um, oh dear, remind me the second question very quickly. <laughs> it was it was about what what the way we speak about an action. Oh right, and, right, right, right. So yeah, so this you'll also see different different you know terms used. So one, as you know, that I particularly dislike is enactivism. 
right? So we see this in philosophy. We have an is, I hate isms. I mean, like isms indicate fixities of thought. And the last thing I want to do is be tied to an ism or to, you know, go down defending an ism. I mean, what a, what a horrible way to live. Um, so I never use the word inactivism, except in situations where I absolutely have to for one or another reason. Um, I tend to always use an active approach, which is what you know, we used in the embodied mind, because that's actually how I think of it. I think of it as an orientation or, or an approach. You could say maybe a framework, a perspective, you know, depending on context. As for practice, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't say there is an, an inactive practice. There may be many inactive practices. So I would, I would very much want to be pluralist about it. I mean, Hannah described one in her talk. You know, I think of Although maybe that's a method, not a practice. So um, there, may, you know, there are many methods, and methods are used, you know, depending on the kinds of questions you have. And practices, I, I think there can be an, an act of inspired practices or practices in tune with an action. But I would be a little bit hesitant to say a, an inactive practice without a lot more elaboration about what exactly that would mean. It would depend on the context, I suppose. So that's, I mean, that's a kind of general answer that might not be too helpful, but that's, no, that's it's at least a great how answer. It's a great answer. I, I think as an analyst, as a psychoanalyst, um, I always go to trying to think about resistances. So trying to imagine what would be the resistance to thinking in terms of mutual circulation as opposed to say complementarity, to mm -hmm. sticking two things together versus the types of methods it takes and the time because it's historical it takes to um, to experience this mutual circulation because it's not observing it it's experiencing it and so in there I can see some pretty solid reasons for resistance um, but this comes back to the question of you know are we speaking to the choir, you know, and, and how do you bring someone into a practice who does, or into a mind, uh, what was the Ezekiel's uh, term? Think, think, think style. style. Yeah. Think style. Yeah. Um, yeah, style. It's actually going to be much more difficult to sustain than probably a whole lot of other think styles. So that was a little bit my motivation. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it for me. I, I, I presume that there are lots of questions here. Uh, um, Amy, I think we have to be uh, actually uh, pause the session right now um, so we can have a break uh, before Richie's uh, presentation. Th thank you both so much.